All right, welcome back. Come on in, have a seat. Close the door. And how's everybody doing for day two? Awesome. Well, we've got uh, a really exciting session for you, uh, a keynote that I'm, I'm looking forward to introduce. Uh, Paul Check has been a personal friend of mine for several years now. Um, in, I first met his wife Penny in probably 2008. Uh, I met Paul face to face in 2011. Uh, he had a big 50th birthday celebration in San Diego. I happened to be traveling around the country on a tour bus for five weeks, and uh, we were filming some documentary footage we did. If, if you've been around a while, you might have heard it, seen it, uh, on uh, entrepreneurs in the fitness industry. And we ended up uh, speaking at this big event for Paul's birthday. Paul and I hit it off instantly uh, in quite some great stories. Uh, and, uh, and we interviewed Paul for the documentary. And since then, uh, we've just formed a, a, just an incredible friendship over the last uh, you know, six, seven, eight years. Uh, and if you've, you're in fitness and you don't know who Paul Check is, you don't know fitness. Uh, he is a original leader and founder of Holistic Health in the world today. Um, anything that, uh, that you've learned or learned from people that uh, have influenced your life, uh, Paul is the leader of leaders uh, in the last few decades around the world, globally, really, around the world. Uh, the work he's done with the Institute, advancing uh, so many different, uh, he holds patents, he holds copyrights, uh, IP he's created uh, and scaled uh, for really just <laughs> mastering yourself um, and you're going to hear some great stories, not only about um, the things that he's learned and shared and, and influenced, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives and professional coaches and therapist lives around the world today, uh, but really about his entrepreneurial journey along the way. Uh, you might ask, how, does, how did Paul Check become Paul Check? Because I'll tell you, there's no one like him in the world. Uh, and uh, he's been through the journey of entrepreneurship just as many of you as, have been. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this session. Uh, and we've got a little uh, meet and greet after for our, our, uh, our pro and platinum clients with Paul and some fun things planned as well. So uh, please put your hands together for my friend, Paul Check. I'm your booty man. That's what I am. I'm here to do whatever I can. Be it early morning, late afternoon, or at Thank you. It just brings up a lot of emotion to see who, see who wasn't so excited. <laughs> oh. Thanks for sharing with me, you guys. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, I'm going to talk about the foundation of successful personal training, coaching, and holistic living, and the four doctor approach. The four doctor approach is. Uh, really the synthesis of my life's work. And um, Sean asked me to talk about a number of things, and I, and I will share those things. But I'll tell you that one of the things that we have to uh, engage when we have a uh, high level of creativity and uh, a real sense of direction is that sometimes we move so fast that uh, even intelligent people have a hard time keeping up and understanding. And when you work hard and immerse yourself fully in your dream, sorry, it's just emotional for me. It's, a, it's, it's been a, a long journey. You have interesting experiences, like even your top students coming back to you after years of study and saying, Paul, you've taught me so much, but I have a hard time integrating it all and figuring out what to do with who, because there's so much information. And it really, uh, it really kind of freaked me out when that started happening to me, because some of these people you know, my, my system's multidisciplinary. We've got 
medical doctors in there, we've got osteopaths in there, we've got nutritionists in there, we've got podiatrists in there, we've got nurses in there. I mean, it's full of people. I've got, uh, you know, my institutes train well over 10,000 people at a very high level. And so when, when they kept telling me that uh, they're having a hard time putting it together, I really had to go into deep meditation. And uh, fortunately, I have a long time relationship with my soul because I spent time with monks when I was a kid and learned to meditate and learned deep spiritual practices that have helped me stay centered and not get blown away by the journey. And uh, so the four doctors is what came to me. And uh, I'm going to share those four doctors with you. And I'm going to show you how uh, you can combine simplicity and complexity together and create something quite beautiful. So let's see what I have in store for you here. Sean wanted me to share a little bit about my journey. So uh, one of the things I'll tell you, it hasn't always been easy to be me. Um, I only have a ninth grade education. Uh, my parents' rule was, if you leave school, you leave the house. <laughs> And, and I was more interested in getting out of the house than I was staying in school, and I really found school very frustrating. Um, as a kid, it used to irritate the hell out of me that the, most of the questions I asked couldn't get answered, or they got irritated at me for asking questions. And because I was raised on a farm, and, and uh, it was a very practical environment, by the time I was... 13 or 14 years old, I could do things that most adults couldn't do. So I had no fear of the world, so I left at 16. And I'll share things about my whole life with you, but uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the inner workings of a guy like myself. I don't know how many of you are familiar with tarot. Most people think tarot is kind of some kind of fluffy divination, weird stuff, but it's actually not. I've studied it very deeply, uh, as I've studied most things that I talk about very deeply. And tarot is really the major arcana, or the 21 archetypes that are essentially the key functions of the mind of the universe. So when it comes to how a person thinks and relates and to the events that we all go through in our lives, the 21 major archetypes, archetype means original pattern, for example, the original pattern of a king or an emperor, the original pattern of a queen, the original pattern of a fool, the original pattern of the high priestess, which means your inner world, your intuitive world, your inner sense of yourself. Uh, so you can use your birthday, and there's various formulations and methods for figuring this out, but in tarot, my soul path is the emperor, which is the master of synthesizing earth, water, fire, and air. So anyone that has a soul path of number four usually makes a great business owner or an entrepreneur or an inventor because they have the inner genius of the emperor archetype and the emperor to rule a kingdom effectively has to understand the earth, that which things are made of, the water, that which flows and connects everything together, the fire, the principles, and the power that moves things, that which consumes, but that which warms, and that which grows, the sun warms and grows, and air, air relates to the mind and to breath and to spirit. So the emperor sits on top of the earth and learns the process of integrating the elements in order to support the people of his kingdom. For me, the people of the kingdom that I'm concerned about are the people of the world. That's what drove me. At an early age, I could see people in the world were lost and, and were getting into things that were causing them a lot of pain. The personality path for me is the fool. The fool is a very unique archetype because the fool lives above all the other archetypes that everybody else is kind of stuck in. So most of the time, people's archetype or personality or soul path is one where they're very fixed on things. 
But the fool is unique because the fool actually rides above all of them and looks down into them, can see every one of them, but somehow isn't stuck on any one of them. So that's the unique characteristic of a guy like me that can work in many, many different fields with many different people, but never have a bias. For example, I'm sure you've met medical doctors that think chiropractic is a bunch of silliness, and you've met chiropractors that do not like physical therapists, and physical therapists that do not like chiropractors. There's the stuck in a viewpoint, you see, but the fool looks past that and says, well, what are you guys, you're supposed to all be helping people, aren't you? Who cares? If, if you're good at this, then teach each other how to do it because there's almost seven billion sick, broken people on the planet. Quit playing silly games. That's the fool, right? The fool says, let's get to the real issues here. Let's not play silly games with people and leave your professional silliness at the door. It's not helping anybody. So the fool walks on the edge. You see he's walking on the edge of a cliff. The dog represents his ego. The ego is not a bad thing. Without your ego, you wouldn't be able to love. If you had no sense of self, how would you know you were being loved or that you were loving anybody? Could you do that? You couldn't, could you? If you didn't know who you were, you wouldn't know who you were loving or who was loving you. So the ego is basically saying to the fool who tends to live so far out on the edge, don't go any further because you might fall off that cliff. And that's the tightrope that people who have minds that can see and perceive a lot of things walk on, and usually the people that pull them over the cliff are the people that don't like the chiropractors or don't like the medical doctors, right? So Sean asked me to say, how did I share with you, how did I become Paul? Well, I was born, that's the start. How did the Institute grow and become a global leader as it is today? Where did, uh, what were the goals? What were the challenges? Lessons learned along the way? and advice or stories that I can share for others who have a big vision to create something in the world. Well, I started right off with that, didn't I? There you go. Your first lesson is get the book uh, by Angeles Arrow, uh, Arian, Tarot Handbook, and go to page 232 and figure out what your soul path and your life path, your personality path are, and read about yourself and get ready to be blown away. Because when you read that, it's as though somebody, Angelis Arian, looked inside of your soul and know, knows exactly who you are, and it's pretty profound. I do this with my clients, and it freaks them right out. So I was born in Los Angeles. I was raised in a farming family. Um, my first, my, my original, my actual father was a professional drag racer, a, man, a mechanic for uh, Buick. And he was a competitive dancer. Unfortunately, he liked to run around with his dance partners, took off, left my mother at 18 years of age with three kids, nobody to feed her, didn't support her with any money. And she had to work two waitressing jobs a day back to back to pay for babysitters to watch us, to keep us alive. She met my stepfather, who was a special effects man for Universal Studios and was in charge of taking care of Will Rogers' ranch, which is some hellaciously huge ranch, like about a million acres or something like that, out in Malibu. So we used to live in Malibu when I was a little kid on a farm, and my dad would uh, take us out to the ranch to do work feeding cattle and all sorts of stuff out there. Then we uh, moved out of L.A. My parents didn't want to raise us in L.A. for various reasons, and we... Uh, moved to Idaho. We had a pig farm for three years. Then we moved to Cottage Grove, Oregon. My parents wanted to specialize in the cultivation of black wool. So my dad and my mother were going to purchase key rams that were known to produce black offspring. So sheep with black wool is rare, if you don't know. And my mother's a weaver, a spinner, a craftsperson, and she's now a world-famous sculptor as well. I forgot to put pictures of her sculpture in there. She's in major museums and things like that. Um, so then we moved to Vancouver Island, British Columbia. We had a cattle truck full of sheep that my father and mother had selectively purchased based on their genetics and their ability to produce black offspring. We became immigrants of Canada in 1972, and my father is still on our farm, 142-acre sheep farm, 
and we raised our own produce. And there was tough times for us. Uh, the unemployment rate was very high. The logging industry would go down. Uh, people would be unemployed. So we pretty much spent a lot of time living off of our farm and eating off of our farm, hunting. We had deer, we had elk. It was, it's wild out there on Vancouver Island. The first year I moved there, we had eight feet of snow, which was a bit of a shock for a little kid. I'm like, oh my God, the snow's up over the roof of the house. And the bad part of it for a kid is our driveway was about a third of a mile long. So you know how much snow shoveling that is? <laughs> well, I'll show you a picture of what happens when you live on a farm in that kind of an environment and you're a kid and you'll see where my athletic career really began. There I am at 13 years of age. Okay. So I played uh, most sports in school. I excelled in boxing, kickboxing, motocross. I was a sponsored motocross racer by Honda when I was young. I set two military records in the obstacle course competitions. I was also a successful stock car racer. I set three track records my rookie year. And I played almost every sport you could play. Sports was my escape from the farm. My father, well, let's just say his uh, motto was an idle child is a useless child. Um, his concept of play was non-existent and he had a lot of work to do and he worked us as full-blown adults and the only way you could get rest was to disappear somehow. So that meant going off into the woods and playing sports was a, an occasionally acceptable excuse to leave the farm. So I immersed myself in sports uh, to channel a lot of my pain and emotion. Um, he was not an easy man to live with. Um, we'll leave it there, but let's just say you constantly had to have your wits about you. And it was either get it done right the first time or you might experience severe pain. So uh, looking back on it, he taught me how to work, get a job done and not complain. Um, I won't, I wouldn't use that tactic on our children, but it did give me the strength to go through everything I had to go through to get here with you guys. Okay. Now, you know, the fool is a different kind of person, and you're about to find that out. Some of you already know enough about me. Um, there you can see my first son, Paul Jr. That's my first wife. I, have, I was uh, just turned 18 years old two weeks after... Uh, two weeks before my son, my first son was born. So I was thrown into adulthood very quickly. My family had no money and my wife's family had no money. So I had to make it happen. There was no, and my ego was too big to collect welfare. I was, couldn't do that. So there's my first son there. There he is now. He's 38 years old today. He's six foot three. How that happened, I don't know. Maybe the milkman. Um, <laughs> His mother, Sue, actually was an elite volleyball player. She was chosen for the Canadian National Volleyball Team right out of high school. She's an elite marathon runner. And I met, after 17 years of marriage, we had a very hard time because we were together from, the, from 16 and we really um, never got to be intimate with other people. So that was a kind of a, a burning challenge for us after 17 years. So when I left Sue, I decided that I would never get married again, which was wrong. I found out it was wrong. But I said I had to make sure that I was completely honest with whoever I married, that I could not be in a monogamous relationship because it just was too painful for me to have the desire to be intimate with other women, but risk the fear of having to tell a lie to somebody that I loved. So I said to myself, the only way around that is to find someone who loves you enough to let you be yourself. And I wrote down everything I needed in a partner and meditated on it for a year and a half. And I had a vision. And one week later, she appeared in one of my classes. It scared the hell out of me. I knew I was going to marry her the instant that I saw her. And four days later, we were engaged. And that was 21 years ago. And she's still the most amazing woman and my best buddy and who helped me build the Institute, and I love her deeply. And that's Penny, and that's Penny there. 
And then Angie Check is a woman that I was very, very much a good friend with. She's a shaman. We had a lot in common. And we spent time together. And as quite a big surprise, she got pregnant. And it scared the hell out of me because I think I was 50-something. I'm 56 now. And I thought for sure Penny was going to say, that's enough, I can't take that. Uh, because Penny... Uh, didn't want to have kids. She even got her tubes tied so we wouldn't have kids. And when she got pregnant and Penny said, it's okay, we'll, we'll roll with it. I'll see how it goes. It was quite a blessing. And so now uh, we have our little mana. And mana means life force. And believe me, this kid is life force energy. I've never seen anything like it. Man, this guy is just wild. You'll see another picture of him later. So now... Uh, Penny and Angie and I and Mana all share a beautiful household and it's really quite amazing for me because as a kid I had a very broken, very painful family, uh, very stressful family environment and now for the first time I have a family with tons of love in it and I'm excited every day because I get to come home and, and have the kind of family life that I didn't really get to experience as a kid in my own life. So I introduced you to me as the fool so that you could see that this is the way the mind of the fool works. The fool isn't caught up in convention and the emperor cannot afford to tell lies because it will ruin his kingdom. And so that's who I am. So a bit about my work and my learning history. Um, that's me falling trees in 22 feet of snow on sh snowshoes. I was a faller in logging camps for uh, a few years in my youth, and it's the most dangerous job in Canada. About 55 to 60 men a year get killed falling trees. It's very dangerous when you're falling trees in snowshoes because you cannot run from the tree when it falls. And some of these trees are 200 feet tall, 197, 200 feet tall. Uh, the biggest tree I ever fell was 9 feet by 13 feet at the butt. Of course, today, as a man who's more educated, I wouldn't fall trees. Uh, I wouldn't kill trees. But when I was a young man who didn't know these things, I was doing my best to raise my family. And that's probably the best job you can get in a logging camp. It usually takes about 20 years to promote, get promoted up the ladder. And without a long story, I was able to... Uh, steal my dad's chainsaw, go out into the back of our 140-acre property and train myself how to fall trees. And one day I challenged for a job with a falling company. And the way the guy did it was he threw a five-gallon gas and jug out like, just like that and said, if you can hit that jug with that tree, I'll hire you. Because he said, you're too young to be a faller. I don't know how in the hell you think you can do this job. Because I was 18. And I hit his jug for him and he hired me and he said, I'll hire you because you're pretty good, but you were scared to death, so you need to be trained. I'll take you on as an apprentice. So he trained me, and I became a full-fledged faller and got to work in logging camps and make pretty damn good money. Back then, I was making $250 a day for a six-and-a-half-hour day. So I was 18, 19, making good money back then. That's a long time ago. So I was a farmer. I was a mechanic. I went to automotive and industrial repair school. I was... In Canada, you can go to a trade school and they'll pay for it for you. So I'm a certified mechanic, a journeyman mechanic. I'm a logger. Um, I did exploration and water well drilling and learned how to douse, which became part of my therapy as a medical douser. Uh, I was a fisherman in the Florida Keys. I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was trained to repair weapon systems in Cobra helicopters. I was the trainer of the United States Army boxing team and I fought on the boxing team. That's how I became the trainer. Uh, they, they knew I was doing something different because I was representing the United States Army in triathlon while I was fighting on the boxing team. So I had to do all the boxing training, which is four to seven hours a day, and I would do my triathlon training in the morning and at night after my boxing training. So I was actually representing the Army at the international level in two completely different sports at the same time. And so the coaches were always baffled. How in the hell can one human being do this? Because this is wiping out 
you know, our boxing team was the third best boxing team in the world. We were only ever beat by Cuba and Russia. So they're like, how in the world can he do that? And they always knew I was weird because these guys kept eating at fast food restaurants and doing silly stuff. And I was eating raw vegetables and, uh, you know, uh, dipping broccoli in yogurt and, you know, bringing hard boiled eggs to work and, and, and taking my time to train my weight down to fight. I fought at 147, but I had to lose about 22 pounds to get to fighting weight. And I didn't have a lot of fat on me to begin with. So when my company commander said, Paul, I want you to train full time for the Army Triathlon because I'm going to bet a lot of money on you and I want to win. He said, if you want to leave the boxing team, you can. So I went back and told the boxing team I was going to leave and train full time because I knew I wasn't going to turn pro. Uh, I started fighting at 12 and a lot of these guys by the time they were 12 had you know, years and years of fighting under their belt. So even though I was a good boxer compared to the best guys in the world, uh, if I would have turned pro, I probably would have ended up with a bad brain injury because it would just, my fighting style was too aggressive and not, not uh, uh, let's just say I, I stung like a bee, but I didn't float like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, at that level, I was fighting guys that were so fast they could hit me three times before I could hit them once. And if it wasn't for the fact that I had a pretty tough constitution, I probably would have never made it that far, but I knew I wouldn't make it in professional boxing without some kind of real serious problem, so I, I took the job as the trainer. I then got trained as a sports and clinical massage therapist and ultimately became a holistic health practitioner in the state of California. I got my license to give medical injection as a physician's assistant at the request of 13 orthopedic and neurosurgeons that I worked with because none of them could ever find trigger points and every time they tried to inject them, they missed. So they finally got wise and said, Paul, why don't we get you trained to inject because you can feel all these things. They used to have to call me into their evaluation rooms to find the points and mark them with a surgical pen, but then they would miss the points. So they got together and said, let's send you to medical a physician's assistant school. So I got licensed to give medical injection. And so I had a lot of experience with hypodermic needles, which ultimately I took a, a training in dry needling from a famous medical doctor named C. Chan Gunn. So I used acupuncture needles to treat the trigger points, which is atraumatic. A hypodermic needle cuts tissue. Acupuncture needles don't cut, they spread. So I was able to do a lot of work with chronic pain patients, which is very unusual for a massage therapist to be able to do that kind of work because usually it's only done by medical doctors. So I had a, a number of very unique experiences like that in my career. I was a personal trainer uh, only to get a license, but I never really functioned like a personal trainer. More, I functioned like a coach. And a lot of my patients had serious problems, and a lot of my patients, most, many of my, you know, a huge percentage of my patients were elite athletes that nobody could figure out. So I trained them all the way back to high level performance. That was the unique thing about my approach, is I rehabilitated them, and I wrote their programs and trained them all the way back to high level performance and then I would turn them over to their coaches, which often caused a problem because it turned out eight times out of 10, the coaches that they were working with didn't have the skill to train them and they were actually destroying the athletes, which is ultimately what led me to get a lot of consulting work with professional sports teams, which too many to mention at this point. I also specialized in Norwegian medical exercise therapy, which is a very comprehensive system of medical exercise, which I was trained in and I'm licensed federally as a medicine man spirit guide. So I do practice Native American healing and I am licensed to use uh, sacred medicines, anything that comes from nature, such as mushrooms, ayahuasca, things like that, which are used very, very carefully and spiritually, not foolishly. My team physician on the Army boxing team was an osteopathic physician, so I learned a lot about taking care of acute sports injuries from the team physician. So I really started at an early age, at 22 years of age, uh, actually 20, 23, to learn how to take care of sports injuries from, from a medical doctor, which was very, very helpful because I got the kind of the mindset of the osteopathic physician. He was a he was the team, he was a real me medical doctor, but he wasn't an MD, he was a DO, American trained DO. Then I went to work out of sports massage therapy school in a chiropractic clinic with a man that was known as the running doctor who specialized in working with elite running athletes and he was a competitive marathon runner. 
And so then I got hired by the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego, sports and orthopedic physical therapy, with 22 physical therapists, athletic trainers, and they had 13 surgeons and neurosurgeons that worked there. And that gave me a huge opportunity. And the reason I got hired is because the owner of the clinic was, had just had her fourth knee surgery, and her knee was so badly damaged that the therapist couldn't do anything for her, and the orthopedic surgeon said, because she had a, she developed a frozen knee, which means her joint locked up and she couldn't move it. And the therapist said, that the, or surgeon said, if I have to manipulate this knee again, you're probably not gonna be able to play golf and tennis, which were her two primary sports, because there's too much damage in your knee. And I had rehabilitated uh, an athlete named Kevin McCary, who was sponsored by Nike. And he worked for her as an athletic trainer, and he said, well, before you let him manipulate that knee, go see this guy, because he rehabbed my tens, and he does stuff I've never seen anybody do. In one visit, I was able to get more range of motion in her knee than her therapist had in months and months of therapy, and it blew her mind, because she had a master's degree in physical therapy. She said, Paul, where did you learn all this stuff? You're using things I've never, ever seen before. So, when you have worked in as many fields as I have, you can see the body from the eyes of a mechanic, you can see it as the eyes of an electrician, you can see it as the eyes of a plumber, you can see the eyes through the eyes of a farmer, so you learn to see things in different ways. So one of the messages I want to share with all of you is, you can get to the point in your life where you wonder, why am I doing some things? Why, why you look back on your life, why was I having to do that? But there comes a time when all of a sudden, your soul rises up in you and you realize that everything you've ever learned in your life and all the experiences you've ever had and all the scary, painful experiences converge and all of a sudden you realize it's as though the stars have been guiding you all the time. And that was one of the moments where I realized that the universe was guiding me into this experience. And I was able to help this woman because I had so much diverse knowledge that I could see things that traditionally trained doctors and therapists could not even perceive. So that led to me being hired by them, which was uh, quite cool. And then after that, I got so busy that it was causing problems there. I, was, I had sometimes a year waiting list and I had athletes getting pissed off and people fighting and buying my time up way in advance. So I decided to go with a partner and start our own physical therapy clinic. So I started my own physical therapy clinic. My partner, we worked under my partner's license and I basically was able to run a successful physical therapy clinic for three years. And then the insurance companies were paying us so little money on the billings that we were having a hard time making any money, even though our billings were, were really good. If we would have got paid what we were, should have been paid, we'd have been fine. So we decided to sell it because the environment was getting worse. We basically got several times what, we, what it cost us to start it, and that's how I started the Czech Institute in 1995, as I took that money and started the Czech Institute. Now, in my training, I've done over 5,000 classroom hours of specific workshops and hands-on trainings with the best doctors and therapists in the world. So there's a tip for you. I didn't go to a standard education. When I needed to learn more about spinal discs, I researched who were some of the best people in the world at spinal discs. And I would either hire them to train me or I would go to their workshops. When I got famous enough, people used to trade me. They said, okay, Paul, I'll pick your brain for a day, you pick my brain for a day, and we'll call it even so I didn't have to pay. I spent thousands of hours, I averaged $36,000 a year for about the first 16 years of my career just on education alone. I spent almost every spare penny I had traveling the world learning from the best people. Sean Greeley is one of the best people you can learn from. That's why you're here, isn't it? Right? He's a master at what he does. And that's an example of finding the best people to teach you. And he has taught me a lot, and my wife. Now, my primary goals in starting the Institute have been the goals I've always had from the beginning. Help people live their dreams and feel good doing it. Holism, teaching people how systems integrate together. When you live on a farm, you do not have the latitude to play silly games. You can't forget to water animals. You can't forget to feed animals. 
you quickly learn that the quality of the food affects the health of the animals. And if you try to go cheap on food, your animals get parasites, get sick, and start dying. You learn how systems work together, and you learn that you have to stay on top of it. And you can't just decide you're tired when things need to get done, or animals die, plants die, and you're in trouble. So that's holism, learning how things work together. And because my mother, who was a Christian scientist, became part of the Self-Realization Fellowship when I was 12, and I watched a radical transformation in her relationship with my father, who was a hard man to get along with, believe me, and could be very physically abusive, when my mother became a yogi, it was as though angels came to the house and calmed everything down. And my mother became much more emotionally stable, and even my father was less violent because my mother learned how to interact with him in ways that didn't incite violence. So I was very, very excited to go to the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple and learn from the monks. And when I was 15, my mother sent me away for the summer to live with the monks, and I learned a lot from the monks. And those techniques have kept me alive through hard times because to be a trailblazer is not an easy path, I can promise you that. So I wanted to share these techniques and things I've learned through personal, professional, and spiritual development. So the Czech Institute's programs have those elements woven in because any Czech professional is already going to be very different than other people. In fact, the number one reason I lose practitioners is because they can't stand up to the social pressure of being different than other people. People say, why are you using a blood pressure cuff? Why do you do all these measurements on people? And some of them aren't strong enough to stand in their own feet and be proud of what they're doing, so they have to fit in, so they end up falling off the wagon and going back to counting reps and doing crunches off the floor because that's easier for them than the social pressure. So to help people sustain themselves and stay in their center, I did a lot of developmental work to create a personal, professional, and spiritual development system that's woven into the Czech Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Program. That's a map of the overview of the entire Czech system. I spent many, many years studying Rudolf Steiner's work. I probably have about 180 of Steiner's books. And basically this shows the integration of the Czech system. Sense man is the nervous system. Rhythm man is the hormonal system. Metabolism man is your metabolism of yourself. Limb man is the musculoskeletal system. Dr. Happiness is the chief of your dreams and your mind. Dr. Quiet is the chief of rest. Dr. Movement is the chief of movement at the physical, emotional, and mental level, and Dr. Diet is the chief of what you feed yourself, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Those symbols are astrological symbols, which are actually influences or forces acting upon us from the universe, just like the tarot archetypes. Those tarot archetypes orient themselves directly to those symbols, and Astrology seems kind of fluffy if you look at it in the newspaper, but if you understand the depth of it, it's quite profound, and, and I've studied it enough and worked with Vedic astrologers and Western astrologers when I had patients that were not healing, and I was doing everything I could. So I went to astrologers. I found the Vedic astrologers to be better, and it blew my mind because they told me exactly what was going on and why that person was, he wasn't healing and when they would start to heal, and they did. And I, I watch things very carefully. I have very elaborate tracking systems. And when I saw that happening, I realized there's a lot more to astrology than we realized, so I looked into it and it has become something that's part of my understanding of how the universe works, and it's very, very profound, actually. So, as Sean said, I'm an inventor. I have multiple patents. I, I won't go into them all because it's, I need to be, keep moving us forward time-wise. But there are patents that have to do with uh, orthopedics of the body, the measurement of the body so that I can rehabilitate people effectively. And I teach all Czech professionals how to use calibrated instruments to measure the spinal curves, measure joint function, assess muscle length tension relationships, Czech professionals are trained to design programs scientifically, and if the program's not working, they know it right away because they're measuring and tracking their progress. So it's an objective, no bullshit system. That's the unique thing about it. 
and I had to develop it that way because my approach was so different that when I went to work with all those physical therapists, they immediately began to attack me because I was doing things they were told in school never to do, such as having back pain patients squatting or lunging, and doctors used to freak out, and they would get all upset at me, and I would say, how's your patient doing? And then they would look at me kind of stunned and go, well, to be honest with you, they're the best they've ever been. I see that's interesting, isn't it? Maybe you should meditate on that. <laughs> because I just got more progress in six visits than the therapist that had them before did in 123 visits. And they said, we were, we were taught that people should never squat when they got back injuries and disc injuries. I said, really? I said, come over here, look out the window. See that lady walking out the door right now? That's your patient. She just left me. Watch her get into her Nissan 240Z and do a single-legged lateral shift coupled with a squat and a twist and a bend. And you'd think she shouldn't be squatting. And which one of your patients can poop standing up? <laughs> Have you ever seen anyone poop standing up? I haven't. I'll tell you what, it makes for quite a bowl of spaghetti. And how about all your patients with kids who have to get down on their knees and help them get dressed? I said, it's a very dangerous game you guys are playing, but I can't afford to play that game because I make my living based on getting results. I don't have the personal freedom to lie to myself. So I do what I need to do for people, and if it doesn't fit your convention, then pay attention to the results. If I'm ever hurting your patients, let me know. One time I had a professional baseball player who was referred to me by a surgeon. And he was six days out of surgery. And his first session after I finished the evaluation, I did one hour of exercise. But I used a total gym. I've been working with total gym for 20-something years. So I can use the total gym because I can unweight his spine. So there was no pressure on his spine. He went back to his doctor, and his doctor said, how you doing? He said, oh, my God, I went to Paul Check for my therapy. In our first session, we worked out for an hour. I feel great. And before he could say anything more, that surgeon had the phone in his hand, called me up, and I had the phone out here. He was screaming at me so loud. And I go, what the fuck are you doing? Do you realize this guy had spinal surgery? You're going to ruin this guy. He was a professional uh, baseball player, yeah. And... Um, I said, see, I said, after he finished, I said, Doc, how's he doing? And the phone went dead, silent. I said, did you ask him how he's doing? He said, well, in fact, he says he's doing really well. He's quite happy. I said, did you think about that? <laughs> I said, why don't you come down to my office, and I'll show you how, you how I do it. And I had built my own unweighting systems, which look like engine hoists. You know, I used to build race cars, and I'm a mechanic, so... I, this is way back when unweighting systems were hardly even known about. So I built systems and weld, had them all welded up so I could put people in what looks like a parachute harness and I could suspend them at a percentage of their body weight and have them do all sorts of stuff, walking on treadmills, squatting, all sorts of things, and I could adjust the load on their spine to negative pressures. So I was able to exercise people and keep their hormones going and their circulation going and all sorts of cool stuff. So when that doctor came down, who used to be the doctor for the New York Knicks, and saw what I was doing, it blew his mind. He was absolutely gobsmacked. He said, I've never seen anybody doing this before. I said, well, next time, don't yell at me when you call. <laughs> um, I created the Primal Pattern Movement System in 1988. Uh, that was a while ago. You know, this whole primal thing's all like the hip stuff today, but most people don't know. I pioneered the whole concept. When I was lecturing all over the world in the late 80s, I started lecturing professionally all over the United States in 88, and I developed a system called the Primal Pattern Movement System because physical therapists were freaked out, as I said, and doctors about what I was doing. So the head physical therapist, who was a very sharp lady, said, Paul, we need you to teach us how in the hell it is you choose which exercises to do how do you know which ones are safe, and how do you know how much intensity to use? Well, I'd never been asked a question like that before, but one of the things that was very attractive to me about my wife Penny is that she has a master's degree in biological anthropology, 
And I had a very deep interest and love of developmental man, so I'd spent a lot of time studying books on developmental man and how we survived in the wild. So I took every single exercise I knew, which was a lot, put them on multiple boards and, and sheets, and I said, I've got to find the common denominators, because that's what I do in my head. I look for the common denominator. Which movement was be the most involved in every other movement? So I took all these exercises and whittled them down to seven key movement patterns that if you could not do, you would not be able to survive in the wild. You understand me so far? Squatting, lunging, bending, pushing, pulling, and twisting. And walking, which has three derivations, walking, then jogging and sprinting. Neurologically, walking, jogging, and sprinting are under separate motor control programs. So I narrowed all human movement down in a functional environment to seven key movement patterns. Well, here's an interesting thing for you. About 10 years later, maybe, yeah, about 10 years later, I did an advanced training program in the Czech Republic with one of the most fam famous childhood development doctors in the world named Vojta, who 50 years studied children and developed an entire system of re-educating the movement system and based on infant development. And when I studied his system in the Czech Republic, it had seven key movement patterns in it that, ch that all children have to go through to learn to walk pro properly. Guess what they were? Squatting, lunging, bending, pushing, pulling, and twisting. And they correlated exactly, and I had probably one of my first orgasms without any sexual contact. <laughs> because I realized that I was being led by the stars. I was being guided by something beyond my own conscious ego. And I've had many, many such experiences like that in my career. These are the kinds of things Czech professionals are trained in. I introduced the Swiss ball to athletes for resistance training and structural balancing in 1994. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know about how much crap you can get from people, you should have seen what happened when I started taking Swiss balls into the gym, mixing it with resistance training, and teaching people how to use these balls. Because I came to the understanding, working in a physical therapy clinic where they were only, well, actually, in the physical therapy clinic, nobody knew how to use it. That's what stimulated my interest. I go, What's that big red ball in the corner? They said, oh, it's for neuro rehab. I said, how come nobody uses it? They said, we don't know how to use it. So I immediately sensed there was something I had to look into. The only good books I could find came from Germany. So I bought these books that were written in German. I couldn't read them, but I could see the pictures. And so I figured out by looking at the pictures, and I started experimenting with it, and I had enough knowledge of anatomy and physiology and kinesiology to connect the dots together, and I developed the first programs in the world for athletes. So I did Swiss ball for abs, buns, and backs, and Swiss ball for athletes. Then I did strong and stable, showing how to mix Swiss balls, free weights, cables, and other apparatus. And I did advanced Swiss ball for rehabilitation. And I was the first person in the world to introduce the Swiss ball to the gym for anything other than aerobic exercise and develop all these exercises. And the reason I did is because Athletes kept saying to me, Paul, this thing works so good. How come nobody's doing this out there? Why did I have to get injured to come to you to learn to do this? And a light bulb went off. I said, yes, why did you have to get injured to learn how to train properly? So I developed all these videos so that athletes and people all over the world could do the right exercises to prevent themselves from getting hurt instead of having to come to a therapist to learn them. So there's an example of the inspiration that came to me through helping people. I pioneered the concept of core conditioning. When I started teaching core conditioning, all people were doing was crunches, and there was a thousand ways to do a crunch, and you still see that silliness today, the 999th way to do a crunch. A crunch laying on your side on top of your cat going down the road in the back of a pickup truck drinking a beer. Okay, It was ridiculous. I'll never forget going to the National Strength and Conditioning Association conference one year, and I thought I was going to get a bunch of cool stuff because they had, were specializing in core conditioning, and all it was was just a thousand different ways to do a crunch. And I went, oh my god, this is so backwards. I've got to do something on the core. And I knew what the core was from my study of anatomy. I did five complete cadaver dissections. I'd been in surgery with every patient pretty much that I ever had, and I could get to surgery with them. So I had a lot of knowledge of the inside of a body. 
And so studying neurology, infant development, all these things, I put together what are probably still to this day the most comprehensive courses in the world, scientific core and scientific back training, on how the core of the human body works. And actually, Charles Pollock cited me as one of the three most influential people in the exercise industry worldwide because I developed the concept of the core. I pioneered the use of health appraisal questionnaires. For some of you who have seen my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, as a series of questionnaires that identify exactly what's going on right off the bat so you know what you need to look at to start your healing so you're doing the right things first, and I show you how to prioritize that. And I've been using these systems with athletes my entire career. Um, I studied it a long time ago. It's been in, uh, part of naturopathic, the naturopathic approach to healing is where it really was more common, but I integrated this and I built my own questionnaires. I did a three year training in functional medicine with a pioneer of functional medicine, Bill Timmons, founder of Biohealth Diagnostics. And he helped me develop the questionnaires that are in How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy from scratch. So those, were, those are original ones that I designed with him, with his help. And I helped him with his body and trade. So I, I also pioneered holistic nutrition and primal pattern eating concepts in healthcare and exercise. I saw the same ridiculous silliness with the diet issue that I saw with the exercise issue. And having studied developmental man and researched eating patterns and eating behaviors all over the world for many years, I could easily see that we're as different on the inside as we are on the outside. So I developed a system to allow people to guide themselves to what they need to eat day by day, meal by meal, instead of following a diet plan, because people get stuck in following plans and your body and your mind are way too dynamic for that. Stress changes everything, environment changes everything, exercise changes everything. So when you learn how dynamic the body is, it, you find out that there's no such thing as a diet that works from meal to meal, literally. You've got to learn how to listen to your body and let it guide you. So I developed an entire system to teach people how to do that, and I teach that to the Czech Holistic Lifestyle Coaches, and you can access the basics of it in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. I also invented the concept that's now popular of putting butter and nut oils in espresso. I taught Laird Hamilton to do that, probably around 2004 or 5. Um, I started experimenting with that because I was, I was always amazed that when you drink espresso, it'll take you up like a rocket, but down like a rock. And I found that very frustrating because I, in order to maintain that high intensity output as a young man, I was working day and night trying to do all this stuff. And I just, I loved the high, but I hated the low. So in my studies of nutrition, I found out that if you add fat to things like caffeine, it'll tie it up. And what my, my impetus was is I studied time-release vitamins. And I thought, well, if they can make a time-release vitamin, I can create time-release espresso. So I started experimenting with butter and nut oils, and sure enough, it stabilized it. And so many people drink coffee on an empty stomach every morning. I thought if I can add some nutrition, that'll be a lot healthier for the gut wall because you can get ulcers drinking coffee on an empty stomach. And I've seen cases just like that. And so I pioneered the whole concept, and now it's used worldwide. And later, when I show you the three phases that new ideas go through, you'll, you'll see what's going on there. And it's funny for me, because I walk into gyms all over the world where people are doing tons of stuff on Swiss balls, and I've even had trainers come give me shit saying that I was doing dangerous exercises. And they say, is that right? What do you know, what do you know about this ball? You ever heard, I said, I said, you ever heard of Paul Check? They go, no. I said, go type it in on the internet. Go type in Paul Check, comma, Swiss ball and see what happens. And I've had trainers come back to me so damn embarrassed they could barely talk. I said, I'm not doing dangerous exercises. I'm doing real exercise. You just aren't able to tell the difference. OK. OK, I pioneered the concept of working in. Working in means to do movements that allow you to cultivate, cultivate more life force energy per unit of time than it costs you to do the exercise. You with me on that? Any movement done at an intensity that is low enough, time with your breathing, so your breathing and your movements are time, just like Tai Chi, brings in more energy per unit of time than it costs you to do the exercise, so you charge yourself up 
working out means it costs you more in energy and resources per unit of time than the exercise delivers, so you go into a deficit. Work in charges the battery, just like charging your phone battery, work out depletes it. So I developed an entire system of charging yourself up with very simple exercises so people didn't have to get up in their head about it, and that's been revolutionary out there, and I've trained some of the best athletes in the world who have had phenomenal results with that. These are a couple of my inventions that you can see there. That measures forward head posture. It was shown in Los Angeles Chiropractic College in a research study with 2,300 measurements to be the most accurate method of measuring head carriage in the world, second only to x-ray. This measures the angle of the first rib. It measures pelvic tilt. It measures the expansion of the rib cage and several other things that are important for designing exercise programs. I've put together and written over 23 correspondence courses for exercise and healthcare professionals. I've written 11 books, and uh, I've been very busy. <laughs> My wife and I have traveled the world extensively. I spent about 25 years traveling the world, lecturing all over the world, teaching students all over the world, at conferences all over the world, and later I'll tell you about the consequences of that. Um, but I, I'm a man that doesn't believe in being a talking head. Many athletes are duly shocked when someone old enough to be their dad gives them a solid ass kicking in the, in the gym. I've worked with many professional sports teams, taught entire rugby teams and, and big name sports teams to lift weights and it's very rare that the guys on the team can outlift me and it freaks them right out. Um, I used to do deadlifts like that off the blocks with five plates aside for 10 sets when I was in my 40s and uh, that would be wearing nothing but Birkenstock sandals and a pair of shorts, no wraps, no straps, no props, no steroids, no tricks. I'm still 56 years old and I can stu still do multiple single arm chin-ups and people always ask me what drugs I'm on and I always say, can you pronounce carrot, chicken, broccoli? Those are my drugs, baby. Okay. <laughs> And I do a lot of stone lifting because it's incredible athletic development, but it allows me to mix artistic expression and meditation with physical exercise. These are just some pictures of our classes from all over the world. I got students around the world, and I'm very proud of them. They do amazing work. Many, many of the greatest sports teams today and the greatest athletes in the world have Czech professionals working on their staff um, so it's exciting. Uh, you know, sometimes people accuse Czech professionals of being people that play with stretch cords and Swiss balls that don't do any real exercise, but those people are just ignorant to the fact that there are Czech professionals working in major organizations all around the world at the very highest levels. Sean asked me to talk about some of my challenges. Well, there are three phases that all new ideas pass through. One, first, it's ridiculed. Second, you meet violent opposition. And third, it is accepted as uh, self-evidence. I mean, self-evident, meaning people think it was always there, just like the Swiss ball. First, I had violent resistance. Then is used with ridicule. Then it's accepted as though it was their idea. And that can be challenging. I have met tremendous resistance along the way with all the concepts that I just shared with you. Occasionally, somebody would be smart enough to say, wow, Paul, that is a badass idea. Teach me how to do it. And when you find someone like that, you know you found an open mind. You want to hug them and kiss them because they're so rare. So uh, if I can inspire you all to be open-minded, that would be a good idea. Okay? Uh, Sean knows about this. <laughs> Sean's seen me in tears over this one. Uh, the Institute has almost been shut down financially because we've had so many people plagiarizing my ideas, making videos, writing books. There's probably at least 30 books out there written that are just straight right out of my courses. Sadly, a lot of my students were the one doing this. But it was a deep, deep spiritual lesson for me. And my wife, Penny, has been my guru teacher. She's always said, Paul, the finest form of uh, flattery is plagiarism. And I said, well, that's good. Just tell the landlord that. <laughs> you know? um, so 
it's a real challenge when you're a leader because people jump on the bandwagon and it's been painful. I've, had, I've opened up medical books published by major medical publishers and seen diagrams in there that I paid my artist to make that came right out of my head that didn't even get referenced to me or anything. And this has gone on ceaselessly. So it's been a real spiritual journey for me to learn to just accept that. So I've had to become a bit of a Buddha. But if you read what it says under this chin there, Sean can tell you that that's true. <laughs> I'm a believer in peace and love, but I do say fuck a lot. <laughs> oh. One of the challenges along the way is even using all the principles and doing the best I could with food, meditation, tai chi, breathing, the level of output for me was intense, and I reached the point where I was so exhausted that I just felt like I needed to climb under a rock and sleep for 20 years. And... Uh, so I finally got to the point where I just said to Penny, even if it shuts the Institute down, I'm going to have to stop traveling because if I go one plane trip further, I'm going to be living against the principles I teach. And I just felt like I was um, spent. I felt like a mother who had too many children and had just so burnt herself out that there was nothing left. And so I had to stop traveling, and it did seriously impact the sales at the Institute, but... We've been doing other things and working with people like Sean, uh, particularly Sean actually in many ways, has helped us keep in the game by em enhancing our systems and sales approaches. And uh, so that's important. So, you know, learning good business skills and management skills is essential because if you don't have them, you will also burn yourself out and you will begin to resent the very people that you're trying to help and you will not have enough love, time, and energy for the people that you do love, and you'll wish that you uh, had a quiet rock to hide under. And that opens the door to a lot of drug abuse as well, by the way. I've worked, I work with many of the top executives in the world for addiction problems. So there's me laying in the front yard, grounding myself, using rattles to sing to myself and say, hang in there, buddy, you'll make it. <laughs> so lessons learned. Uh, tips and lessons, new ideas. Prove it to yourself first, but never bullshit yourself. Test things thoroughly before going to the public. One of the things that I pride myself on is not to take things public till I've tested it over and over again. I've seen it work with many, many clients. I've been able to show it to the most anti Paul Check doctors and therapists and get them to acknowledge, yes, this does work, I can't deny it. Um, if you run out and try to package and sell ideas that aren't well tried and tested, it can come back to bite you and be very expensive in the long run. Uh, plagiarism, I learned that your wife may be, be a better spiritual coach than your guru. Uh, be a thought leader, not a one-trick pony. The pests eat the food, but it takes a bee to make it. You understand that? When you got great ideas, the pests will come eat the food, but you have to be a bee. You have to keep open-minded and explore and constantly come up with new ideas. Because if you've only got one and you can't defend it effectively and it's a good one, then all the little creatures will come eat it up and you'll find yourself in trouble. But what saved me and kept me going all these years is that I'm able to stay focused on my studies, my research, my development, my practice and keep growing myself at a pace that I'm able to come up with perpetual new ideas. So as long as you stay open-minded and, and, and anchored in your game, you'll be okay. But if, you have a, if you're a one-trick pony, then the bugs are probably going to test you. Exhaustion is real, and ego can be an inferno. And, and I'll admit that, you know, I got so much acclaim that it, I kind of filled myself up with it. And you get to the point where you can feel needed by people and you, you think that you've got to uh, keep going and come up with more and more new stuff. And you actually can get so excited about being wanted, being loved, and being needed that you can fry yourself. 
So as Osho says, if you want to be a star, you better learn to play with fire. And so Tai Chi and meditation and organic food, those things kept me from really totally destroying myself. And if there's one lesson I can share with you, it's I before we. You're 50% of every relationship you have. If you burn yourself out, you create an interesting problem. Because if me and you are in a business deal and we're working together, if I show up to work with you and I'm 10% deficient and I'm 50% of the relationship, it creates a 20% deficit because there's 10% of me that I can't access and 10% he cannot access either. So you always multiply your deficits in relationships. And when you're running a business where the other people are involved, to the degree that you deplete yourself, you actually multiply that deficit in all of your relationships. So remember, you are 50% of every we, and your team of we is what supports the all of humanity. And most of you in here work for many people, people in your city, people in your business, people in your gym. So we have to learn to honor that we are the foundation of all our relationships. And if we don't give ourselves what we need, then we spread the deficit around. And the next thing you know, you're frustrated because you're taking lots of expensive courses, doing what you think you should do, but you're not getting the money coming in. And you end up realizing that you're unconsciously sending out a vibration that says, I'm too tired, so as much as I want you to be in my business, stay away. And you, once you get that cured, then all of a sudden your marketing starts working and the magic starts to happen, and eventually you'll say, the one common denominator here is me. So if I can share any lesson with you, it's love, honor, respect, and care for yourself first. Make those issues sacred. Know when you need to exercise, when you need to eat, when you need to sleep and build your empire around that sacred time, or your empire will eat you alive. So when it comes to feeling for your archetypes, which means your dream, your inspiration, and finding soul guidance, be clear what you love to do, be clear about what you need to do, but also be clear about what you're willing and able to do. And when you find the sweet spot between those three, your life is predominantly a life of joy. If you don't get that balance, then your life will be a life of pain and your body will look like the guy you see on the right there. And that's what most of my patients look like. And that's also what most of the experts on health and fitness look like. Have you ever noticed that? All you gotta do is look at all the people that write diet books and go on Google Images and search their image. You'll find most of the people that write diet books use pictures of themselves 20 years earlier but when you find out what they actually look like when they wrote the book, they look like hell warmed over. And that's the kind of stuff I can't get behind. That's what I mean by being authentic. So there's my mana. That's my surprise love who just totally blew my heart open. And just, it's just so amazing. I can't even tell you the, the, the arrival of this little guy was the thing I thought I wanted the least, but turned out to be the most magical experience of my life. And one of the greatest things was getting to see Penny's mothering instincts come out. And my little mana loves his mama Penny too. And it's so special because Penny also thought she didn't want to have kids. And when you see these two together, it's not only enough to just blow your heart open, but Mana's actually starting to have an English accent, which is hilarious, because Penny's English, you know, so Mana has his English accent from Mama Penny, and it's just the greatest thing I've ever seen. So, lessons learned, meet the essentials of optimal living if you want to be optimally creative and productive. Every living philosophy has to have a minimum of four aspects to it, so if you think of life as a wheel, or wholeness as a wheel, if you don't have a movement, quiet, diet, and happiness philosophy, that wheel will collapse and it will not roll. You knock one spoke out of a four-spoke wheel, you get something that doesn't roll. And if you're missing one of those spokes, the amount of energy you will spend to try to roll yourself through life will be very, very high, and you will probably uh, you know, need to reserve a table at Starbucks for the rest of your life. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough, 
is what Einstein said. That was a hard lesson for me. I had spent so much time in technical literature and talking to doctors and elite therapists that I lost touch with what the layman actually understood. And that's why my students were coming to me saying, Paul, how do we break this down? So the four doctor system was what Great Spirit gave me to simplify that, and it helped all of them tremendously. So the KISS principle says, keep it simple, stupid. People coming to exercise professionals are more tired, unhealthy, and stressed than they have ever been. They need mentors of balanced living more than anything else. You understand what I mean by that? Mo most gyms are just ass kicker places, but there's no mentorship there. It's a bunch of people torturing themselves. Today, we need mentors, and that's what check trained professionals are. They're living, breathing, walking, talking examples of balanced living, or they have the training to be, but most of them are far healthier. And so if you do that for yourself, then you send that out into the community, and it feels good when the boomerang of love comes back. My presentation won't be hard for anyone to understand. It's as simple as one, two, three, four. So in the next nine and a half minutes, I'm going to overview some very simple things. That's what the average person coming to a Czech professional looks like today. That's a health appraisal questionnaire. And you can see the list of problems. And that's very, very common for almost anybody coming into a gym today right there. And as you can see, uh, those things usually cost lots of money for doctors to address and often do not get addressed effectively because they're not treating the causes, they're treating the symptoms of living out of balance. All stress summates in the body. It doesn't matter whether it's psychological stress, emotional stress, physical stress, nutritional stress, sleep stress. As far as your body's concerned, it all adds up. And the total stress picture is how you respond to every relationship, every situation, every workout. And if you're not careful, you can burn yourself out and, and get yourself to the point where exercise is actually a very dangerous thing to do. One of my favorite quotes by the psychologist Jerry Wesch, when you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. And, and that's been one of my guiding philosophies. That's what most people look like, and that's what we try to help them organize themselves with. And that's what NPE is very good for, too. You know, Sean and I are very harmonized in our mission, vision, and values, and we believe in supporting people in creating abundance, but also creating health and prosperity so they can enjoy the abundance instead of just spending it on doctors and therapists and pills all the time. So, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a deep love and respect for Sean's philosophy and, and his skill. So really in my system, one is what is your dream? That's the first thing I need to know. I have to know what your motive to change is or you're not likely to stick to it. I have to look at where you're out of balance between the feminine principle of yin and the masculine of yang. And when I find out where you're out of balance, I know what we need to do to live your dream. Then we have to make effective choices. There's only three choices you can make in relationship to any person, place, or thing. The optimal, which is best for everybody involved, you and the people on your dream team. The suboptimal, which gives you instant gratification, but usually causes problems somewhere along the line. And then doing nothing, which usually leads to trouble. Doing nothing's fine if you need more information. Or you're in an argument and you can feel that it's getting unproductive. But doing nothing when you need to be doing something is usually the beginning of the end of a business or a relationship. And then you have Dr. Quiet for rest, Dr. Diet for eating, Dr. Happiness for being clear on your dreams, and Dr. Movement for exercise. And Dr. Happiness sits on a stool that has three legs, and we can't afford to lose any one of those legs. So if your diet, movement, and rest are not optimal, then Dr. Happiness is likely to fall off. Now, I told you I'm a licensed medicine man and spirit guide, which is also called a shaman. Here's the questions that a shaman is trained to ask you if you come to them with a problem. So I would encourage you to ask yourself this if you're having any kind of challenges in your life right now. When did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop enjoying stories? And when did you lose your sense of awe for the majesty and mystery of life? In my 32 year career, I've found those questions, the answers to those questions are almost always the answer to why people have diseases and health problems. And they can track it right back to the time when they stopped singing, dancing, enjoying stories, and being enamored with the mystery of life itself. Your, Einstein said, your dreams are a snapshot of your future. 
So I develop songs to help my students memorize the key points of what they need to be doing with their clients. So Dr. Happy's song is, and, and you're welcome to read with me and sing, it goes like this, Dr. Happy is the dreamer, Dr. Happy is the dreamer, Dr. Happy is the dreamer, don't you know? Dr. Happy sets your rhythms, your rhythms set your pressure, and your rhythms and your pressure make your flow, and your rhythms and your pressure make your flow, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah. Now look very carefully at the words, because I can back this all with hardcore physiology. Dr. Happy sets your rhythms, your rhythms set your pressure, and your rhythms and your pressure make your flow, how your day goes. If you knew how many billions of dollars were spent on drugs every day due to issues of rhythm, pressure, and flow, if you even had 1% of it, you'd never have to work again, know what anyone in your family for seven generations. Okay? If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So having a dream is very important. Your dream functions as your north star. And if you have four doctor core values, you'll get there. Doctor diet is all about food. Doctor diet, build your temple of body for your mind. We raise and eat our food with love. It makes our chemistry. Add good water and a smile. Be filled with energy. Eat good organics and be wise. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. Yum, yum. If you want to know what I teach you in five days of HLC training, it's right there. We've had all sorts of diet gimmicks going on forever, and it ain't working. Here's a doctor and his patient. He says, I want you to follow a healthy lifestyle. Whatever the experts say that is this week. <laughs> there is no right diet for everyone. We all have unique genetic needs. We all have unique internal mental emotional needs. We all have different ways of levels of toxicity. Stress and exercise change our diet needs quickly. If you look at the physiology of each individual's biochemistry, hormones, and these are the kinds of things I teach in my class, you'll see that every one of us is uniquely different. There is no way there can be one diet for everybody. Doctor movement. Doctor movement animates life. Doctor movement animates life. Doctor movement is the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon. The sun works out. The moon works in. The sun works out. The moon works in, and that determines the temperature you are in. Woo! And that determines the temperature you are in. Woo! Hey, how much money is being spent on drugs for chronic inflammation today? Billions of dollars. Billions. So if you don't know how to manage the working out and the working in, you'll never manage your temperature effectively, and you'll burn out. OK? The two forces of the male and the female need to be balanced. Yin brings energy in, yang spends energy. Yin multiplies power, yang divides power. Yang, the male force, is like using a credit card. Yin is like putting money in the bank. So really, at the end of the day, it boils down to these two key forces. Okay? So the secret is train, don't drain. When we do work in exercises with proper breathing, and we couple them with working out effectively, then all the key biological systems of our body are balanced and we're healthy. This shows you that you can use my questionnaires to identify when to push yourself hard, when to go easy, and when to take the day off, or when to get help. Dr. Quiet Song, Dr. Quiet, she is yin, how she loves to bring energy in. She teaches you how to rest so your energy is always at its best. Hey. She'll teach you how to rest all right. You know how she does it? She lets you burn yourself out. Then you got to pay attention. Secret is to listen. When you're tired, be honest about it. OK? The principle here is work hard, rest hard. If we get too caught in doing the rational all the time, then we forget to play and have fun and do the things that are unrational. Love is not rational. Love has no rules. It's passionate. So make sure you stay in love. In my book, I show you all the essentials for sleeping. We really need to learn how to sleep better and how to prepare our environment for sleep. And if we don't do it, we'll burn out. There's one of my clients, Mike Salemi, who recently won a world championship competition in kettlebell lifting and has got multiple Russian master's titles, who came to me 
tired and burnt out and broken, and after two and a half years of coaching, he's set amazing uh, records, met all his goals, and is now one of the leaders in the kettlebell field. So the secret is find balance with your four doctors and live the path down the middle. The word Tao means the middle path, and when we're in the middle, we have room to improvise and adapt. Um, I'm just going to skip through this because, to be honest with you, I have to go to the bathroom so bad I'm about to pop. <laughs> and uh, that's what my client looks like a year later. I wrote her program for her on a piece of paper. Next time I saw her after following Paul's advice, that's what she looked like. She got third in her first body shaping contest. She weighed about 240 pounds in the top left picture. That's what she looked like one year later, doing exactly what's in my Four Doctors ebook and my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. Thank you for sharing with me today. It's been a great pleasure. I'm going to run to the toilet, and I'll be right back. <laughs>